When I was a little boy, there was a radio program. I'm going to date myself here. Some of you will know this, but it was called The Rest of the Story. It was a guy named Paul Harvey. Anybody remember that, Paul Harvey? Yes, us, us old people remember that. <laughs> and Paul Harvey would tell these stories, and, and they always had a cliffhanger. They always had a, a story that needed to be resolved. And he would say, stay tuned for the rest of of the story. And so you, you, wherever you were at, you would listen. You would keep listening to the radio, and eventually the commercials would be over. Uh, the Jiffy peanut butter would be over, and uh, all the weird stuff, the Brill cream for your hair. Remember Brill cream? <laughs> and then Paul Harvey would come back, and he would resolve the story. And it was always, it was always good. Tonight, um, I want to bring a story to you that starts happy. It has a really sad middle and then it ends really happy. And if you, if you get into Scripture and you see the story that God paints in people's lives, whether it be from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, whether it be Joseph, whether it be David, Abraham, every one of them, the stories are amazing that God paints in these people's lives. And there's difficulty and great turmoil, and sometimes it seems like nothing good will ever happen. But because God's painting the story, God is painting these lives, and they're surrendered to him. Every difficult hardship that happens makes something else happen. It's for a reason. Nothing is left. Nothing difficult and hard is for nothing. It always has a result. I came to Christ when I was 16 years old, 16 years old at a, a big church in Stewart. That church back then ran a lot of people, like over 1,000 people every week. And back in the 70s, God was moving in that church. And I was 16 years old at that time. And I came to Christ, and I prayed to know Jesus, and the Holy Spirit began to work in my life. And people like Jack Taylor, we know Jack Taylor, we knew Jack Taylor, and a guy named Peter Lord and Arthur Blessed, these were movers and shakers in the kingdom back in the 70s. They would show up and speak at this church when I was 19, I was invited to lead their junior high school youth ministry. We used to call it junior high. Now it's middle school. And I was so honored because they were such good people. It was always shocking to me. Why, why did they ask me? Do they know me? And I was honored. Since that time, I've been on 12 different church staffs in Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and back to Florida. I've been a youth pastor, a middle school pastor. I've been a senior high pastor, full-time youth minister, worship pastor, lead pastor, a face-it pastor, whatever that is. And now I've been a staff pastor. I am a staff pastor. Why is that important? It's part of the story. I'm telling this because with all of those years of working and ministering in local churches, in big cities and small communities, huge churches and tiny congregations... I think, I think I've seen it all. I think I've seen every wonderful and horrible thing that can happen in a church, in a church staff. Great stuff, sad stuff. I've seen dead churches that stay dead. I've seen dead, kind of dead, mostly dead churches that came alive and then died again. I've seen churches that were right on the edge of great and mighty things, only to watch it all be crushed. I've seen great revivals come and go. In all these years, I've thought to myself, why, why did God let me see all that stuff? I, I will, I'm a family person. I want to plant me in a family, leave me there forever. Every church I've been in, I thought, I want to stay here forever. I want to die. My wife, you know, she, you just love everything. I, I, I want to be here. Twelve different churches. I wanted to stay at all of them. Either something's really wrong with me or God had a plan. Why did God let me see all this stuff? Why all these churches? And really only recently, it wasn't like a, a frustration in me. It was just a curiosity. Why have I been so many places? And why have I seen so much in revivals that almost happened but didn't? In revivals that started but crashed? And why have I experienced this? And here's one reason. If there's a mistake that can be made in a church ministry, I, I've seen the mistake, and I've made a lot of them. And when you've seen what not to do, it makes it easier to know what to do, doesn't it? What to avoid, what to tackle, and what to run away from. 
And then there's the whole thing of revival. I got to go to a, a Bible college called Criswell Bible Institute. It was First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, and it was a brand new school, which is the only reason they let me in. They needed students, and they took me. I had a very low C average at Indian River Community College, and they let me in on probation. Every college I went to, I was always on probation. And while I was there, one Sunday morning, uh, they announced the next day there was going to be a chapel with a special guest. So Monday morning, morning rolled around, and we went to chapel, and there was a great evangelist there, a great Southern Baptist, fire and brimstone preaching pastor named, what was his name? Robinson. Anybody know this guy who I'm talking about? James Robinson? He's no longer a Southern Baptist pastor. But he preached, and it was fiery, and it was amazing. And he said something, and I never forgot it. He said, how many of you here want to see a great revival? 300 young pastors with all the same pastor hairdos, except for me. I had a mullet, <laughs> platform shoes, and a big silky shirt. And they didn't know what, a, what I was. And, and he said, how many want to see revival? And everyone stood up. I, I'm sitting there, wow. But they all yelled, yeah. He goes, how many of you will do anything for revival? They were yelling, yeah. And he said, how many of you will serve it if it comes to the Methodist church down the road? Dead silence. <laughs> Dead silence. How many of you will serve it if it comes to the Pentecostal church on the hill? Silence. And you get a heard a pin drop, and he said, you don't want revival. You want a show, and you want to be the star of the show, and that's what you want, and you make God sick. <laughs> Yay? Nobody knew what to say. I'm sitting, I never, I never got up, because I was not really, in, I didn't know, nobody was smiling or happy, and he went on to preach for a while. He was prophetic. Eventually, he had to leave the Southern Baptist Convention because things happened that could no longer be explained with Baptist theology. <laughs> so God takes all of our stories and he develops them. He puts us through difficulty and hardship. And we come out the other side better. And then a few years later, maybe some more testing and difficulty. And he, and he continues to work with us. He never stops loving us, never stops forgiving us. He keeps working. And as long as we'll keep coming back, he'll keep working with us. That's the way it works. And a few years ago, I was crying out to God for a revival. I was pastoring a church in Jensen Beach. And I was really disappointed. And I was really troubled. I didn't think that we were accomplishing what God wanted us to. When I was in Tennessee and the Lord said, go to Florida and plant a church, I envisioned revival. I dreamed of revival. I had wanted it my whole, I had seen some of it. I'd been to Brownsville and I saw what God did. I went to Toronto, the outpouring at the airport. I saw what God did and I, and I just kept realizing that, I kept believing that it was all for something and that God was showing me this and put a hunger in me for revival. And I'm pastoring this 140 people church, 130 sometimes, 160 sometimes, sometimes 110. And every week it was different. And then sometimes we were all right on the edge. It was about to break through, but it never quite broke through. And about 12 years into it, I was disappointed. And I was crying out to God for revival. Since I was a teenager, I've seen the power of God move and sweep up everything and everyone in its path. And I've longed to see it again. I've longed to be a part of God moving on the earth in a profound and mighty way that rescues the broken and the hopeless and the perishing the way I was rescued. So after reading a book about a pastor in a big city in Bogota, Colombia, this pastor who was disappointed with his small church that really just couldn't break through, and he didn't know why. I think we're familiar with that church. And I read where the pastor decided to go pray for hours a day. He was going to go pray for hours a day. 
he felt led to do that. And when I read the book, I immediately felt compelled. I've got to do that. And I started getting up early in the morning. I had a grace that I had not had before. I'm not an early riser. I'm a one or two in the morning person. I just am, judge me. That's the way I am, okay? I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and I found my tribe. The whole city stayed up till two in the morning and wrote songs. And I, I started getting up early in the morning and going out to pray. And sometimes I prayed and sang in fellowship with God for hours and hours and sometimes for the whole day because I wanted to pay the price. I wanted to make the sacrifice to do whatever it took to see God move in my church, in our city, in our community, in our region. And God made some promises to me during that time. And God made, he brought some people to me he told me clearly that I would see revival. He sent people to me out of nowhere. One day, I sat at Sanspirit Park from 9 in the morning, 8 in the morning, till 5 in the evening, just praising and praying. And, and I asked him, I'm just demanding, not demanding, you know, as much as you can with God. Please, God. And I'm, Lord, send me somebody to tell me it's coming. Please. And I'm telling you, towards the end of the day, I was about ready to go, and a lady came walking up, and she sat in a chair in front of me, and then she got up and left. Nothing. A guy walked by with a dog, and then he stopped, and he looked my way, and I thought, here it is, and nothing. And then a lady came walking up, big hair, African-American lady, big hair, sat down, hair kind of bounced. It was amazing. And, and I felt like I should say something, and I said, Hell, she's in a, one of those benches at Sanspirit Park, like 20 feet from me. I said, hey, how are you? She goes, good. I said, can I talk with you? And she said, oh, yeah, okay. I walked over and said, what brought you here? And she said, well, I was driving down the street, and the Lord Jesus told me to come here now. I'm supposed to tell somebody something. I'm assuming you're him. And I said, I, I am him. And she said, I'm going to tell you all the things the Lord's been telling you he, that he's going to do. All of it, it's coming. All of it, it's coming. All of it. None of it's going to, all of it, it's coming. Do you, you hear me? And I'm like, I, I hear you. And I got my phone. Could you say that again, please? I wanted to record it. And she said, I don't think I can say it the same way. So just say it anyway. And I recorded it. Played it for my church the next day. And I knew revival was coming. And then one day, the grace to get up early morning and pray just kind of went. As a matter of fact, I went with a group from Revive Church to Bogota, got prayed for, I went there, and it, when I got back, the grace was gone. It was just gone. I didn't understand it. And the next couple of years brought some difficulty and sadness and sorrow. The dream of a church that would move powerfully in the name of Christ and change a city, that dream died. And God said to me, you're done here. And I wasn't happy to hear it. He said, let it go. And it broke my heart. And with a sense of utter failure and great sadness and deep hurt and sorrow, I laid it down and I walked away. Never to work in church again. That's what I said. I love God, I love the Holy Spirit, I love Jesus, I, but I just don't want to do church again. It can be very painful because you lay it all out there. And when people get messed up, sometimes they will, they will hurt you. They'll gut you, mercilessly attack you. And I had had enough. Now, funny thing, for 40, 36 years at that time, God had given me the grace to always forgive that. I could just, I could just forgive. You could, you could call me names, call my children names. Don't call my wife names. I mean, you could call anybody names, and I could forgive it. But, but somehow, I just, it just hurt me, deeply hurt me. And then one day, in the middle of all this hurt, in fact, I wouldn't even go out and pray again in the morning. I wouldn't go. I just didn't know. I'm just going to connect with God, love God, but I'm not going to go the extra mile. You know what I'm saying? I'm not doing that. 
I love God. I'll stay in his presence. I'll go to church, but I'm not going to ask for revival anymore. And my daughter says, Dad, can you come to church with me? And I said, where? And she goes, oh, it's Revive Church. Remember Todd Mozingo at Coastal Life? It's Revive Church. And I, I had already connected with Todd a few times, and I had seen a drastic presence of the Holy Spirit that I wasn't as familiar with earlier in my connections with him. He was a man who loved God, a good man, but something was really different with this guy. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go to Revive, honey. I'll. She goes, I, I'm experiencing kind of something in my life, and I'm here, and would you just, mom, you and mom come and sit with me? And I said, sure, I'll do that. So we did that. We came and we sat by our daughter. And, and here's where I'm going with this. In that first service, during the service, during the worship, a young man came walking across the room, and he tapped me on the shoulder in the middle of worship. How rude is that? And he said, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And, um, and he said, I just wanted to tell you, I was sitting over there, and I saw you over here, and the Lord showed me a picture of you, and I don't know if this makes sense, but just, I'm just going to tell you what it is. And he said... I saw a picture of you and you were sitting in a recliner barefooted and you were surfing the internet on a television. You were surfing for recreational vehicles on a TV. And he didn't know because he didn't know me and I didn't know Dominic DiTrelisi at that time. But this kid, I literally thought there's a camera in our house. There's a camera in our house, and somehow somebody's gotten into my house and seen what I'm doing. And, and he said, uh, by this time, I'm very quiet, and I'm starting to break down. Because the day before, he told Saturday, I had spent about seven hours. My daughter and wife were laughing at me. Dad, you're going to go roots into the recliner if you're there any longer. Get up. I was there all day researching RVs. I find a thing, I want to figure it out, right? I'm researching. And this kid now the next day is telling me, the Lord showed me you searching for RVs. And that is what I call the announcement moment where God is announcing, I'm here. I'm here. Listen, you can't mistake the announcement moment because it's like nothing else. When God speaks in such a way that nobody else could know, only you, it's the prophetic word. It's a word of knowledge. And he said... The Lord showed you, I'm sobbing, I'm undone fully. And he said, the Lord showed me that you eventually got up and put on your shoes and God walked you you into a ministry of reconciliation. And I could barely understand what he was saying. I was crying so hard because God, I had not heard from God like that since many, many years before, decades earlier. God spoke to me that way. And he brings me here, and he drops me in, and he keeps harassing me until I surrender to step back into ministry. And from that very moment to now, I have been so humbly grateful, so humbly grateful to be working with people who are truly humble people of of great integrity and humility and kindness and generosity the fruit of the Spirit, which is often lacking in church leadership, is very clearly defined here. I believe revival has begun in this place. And some of you have come from long distances. You've come here and you realize this is why you've come. Right? You, this is why we're here from Washington, D.C. This is why we're here from all over the, the country or from the world. We're here because God is, he is laying the foundation and, and laying all of the framework for a great and mighty outpouring of God. And there is a difference, and I see it. And the difference is mind-boggling to me because I've never been in a place where the presence of God And the leadership of humble men of integrity has been so well-defined and so consistent now for two and a half years I've been here. There's been no pause in it. There's been no variation from it. 
In my lifetime, I've never seen what I'm seeing here in this place. Listen, <laughs> when apostles that I used to didn't even believe in and prophets who scared me, they've always scared me because they're scary. And pastors, I like them. They're all wonderful. And teachers and evangelists who are also scary when they are all functioning in the same house, in love and unity, something is up. Something is happening. Something is happening. Something is building that you cannot deny. And it is something that the framework is so solid and so secure and the nuts and bolts and all the pieces going into it are so strong, it will not be broken down because at its core is Jesus. And it's all built on Jesus. And the fruit of the Spirit is evident to everyone. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. I always get one of those out of order. They're all there. And everyone is seeing and experiencing this. So i got to hurry. I'm going somewhere with this. Listen, seriously. A place where apostles and prophets... And pastors and teachers and evangelists are all functioning in one house in unity. It's, I've never seen it. And it's here. And there are more apostles that we're going to be, God's going to be bringing here and training and sending out. And there are more prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. God is calling together people from all over the country to serve his purposes and to love and serve the many, 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 many people that will be coming to this place. Get ready. Get ready. Clear your schedule. Make plans to be here. Don't get distracted. Seek God like you never have. Old men, young men, and everyone in between, Seek God like you never have. God wants you to be a part of what is happening here and what is coming here. The wave has already begun. It is building. It will build bigger, but it's the foundation of it is Jesus. So it won't destroy anything unless it's evil or ugly. It'll build beautiful things. God wants to use every last one of you in this room. God wants those of you who are seasoned and mature believers to walk closely with those who are not. Did you hear that? God wants those of you who are seasoned and mature believers to walk closely with those who are not. So they can become seasoned and mature, but you can't do that by doing the things you've always done. You can't walk in that door and find, go to the seat you always sit in and talk with the same three people you always talk to. You can't get there from there. You have to go somewhere else to get there. And there's somewhere else is on the way here. I love this church and I love the fact that I can come to church and be ministered to. But on the way here, it's time to pray. Oh God, Holy Spirit, fill me, use me. Show me who to talk to today. He may tell you to go stand on the back wall till he points somebody out to you. He may tell you to go sit in a row you've never sit in before. How weird would that be? He may tell you to talk to people you've never talked to before. But he will direct you. And you won't even know exactly what's happening. And he will direct you. I believe the evangelistic ministry of this church with Mike Delafavi and Heather and others in the middle is a prophetic picture of what's going to be happening here. As God leads them to go to Walmart or to Walgreens or to go to a, a street that's not may, maybe that safe in Fort Pierce, or may, God will direct them and he'll show them when they get there why they're there. This is how God's going to use you and this place to minister to people when they come in the door. And so many will come. So many will come. So get good at it. Men and women of God, get good at it. Get good at hearing God and going and talking to this person and praying like crazy on the way there. God, give me words to say. God, Lord, don't let it be me. Don't let me talk too much, God. I know I can talk too much. Or God, I'm shy. I don't talk at all. Lord, help me to talk. God will give you what you need in the moment that you need it. So I want to read a couple of scriptures and close out. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us 
has one body with many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So we, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all of the others. And each member belongs to all of the others. Say that with me. Each member belongs to all of the others. You're not your own. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I can't do that unless I'm prayed up. I can't do that unless I've been with the Lord. I can't. But it's really not hard to be with the Lord and to get prayed up and to get near to God. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And last, Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, we will fulfill the law of Christ. It is literally all that. What is the greatest commandment? They asked Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We get to do that here. Much opportunity is coming. Get yourself ready. Can I lead you in prayer? Can we do that? And I just want to ask you to take a second just to have a moment with God. Father, I surrender my thinking to you, my heart to you, my, my expectations to you. Lord, I surrender it all to you right now. Lord, I want to be used by you. Not for my sake, but for your sake. That your kingdom would come and your will would be done on this earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Use me, Father. Prepare me, Lord. I surrender my life to you and my time to you and my everything to you. Thank you that I get to be a part of this great move on the earth. Thank you that you're such a loving God and that you love me. That is amazing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we can, are we good? You are dismissed. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.